1952, America is well into its post-war boom and determined to enjoy itself. Harry Truman is still in the White House, and in the campaign to succeed him, Americans are witnessing the birth of a 32nd political ad. For President Ike, for President you like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. In fact, television is already becoming a driving force of a new climate of consumerism. The center of home life is shifting from the dining room table to the living room, where TV sets are the new must-have appliance. It is a cultural revolution, at least in many parts of the country. It's someone you love. Today it may be hard to imagine a world without television, but before September 1952, most of northern Nevada had never seen it. Reno was then home to barely 32,000, Sparks adding another rate. There was an afternoon and morning newspaper, four radio stations, but only a handful of television sets, and for good reason. No reliable signal reached the Truckee Meadows, though the curious or determined might on occasion pull in a hazy picture from Sacramento or San Francisco. The conditions had to be absolutely perfect or you didn't get anything. We never got to watch a full half hour program. 17, 18 minutes was max. The one place in the valley with a reliable picture was a bar on Vista Boulevard. All across the street there was a barbed wire fence and they run the cable hooked the antenna into the barbed wire fence and got a real good signal. But in September of 1952, the rest of Reno would get its first look through a special closed circuit broadcast of the World Series. Dozens of TV sets were placed around the Riverside Hotel, in the lounge, the corner bar, and through viewing windows set up around the patio. Reno came, watched, and was fascinated by what it saw. Cars were double parking, the cops were having a heck of a time because people, they just wanted to see TV. People standing outside looking through the glass. Toward the end, some schools brought their, their kids down and we saw TV in downtown Reno. It was evident that Reno needed a station of its own. I mean, they were hooked right now. Wow, this is absolutely great. And that was the idea all along. Among those who brought this special broadcast to Reno was an Arkansas-based newspaperman, Don Reynolds. Reynolds owned a home at Lake Tahoe and was determined to bring television to Reno, but he faced a problem. To be successful, a station needed an audience, but how to build one in a town with no signal and virtually no sets. The special World Series broadcast had whetted the town's appetite, and Reynolds kept the buzz going, announcing his plans. The local newspapers did their best to ignore this outbreak of television fever, but their back pages began filling with ads for TV sets. It seemed everyone, even drugstores and automotive companies, were selling them. Reynolds was helping fuel those sales with some marketing of his own. It was called Telerama. He invited all those stores selling TV sets to the Riverside and opened it to the public. So they set it up, uh, had a camera up on the raised platform, uh, hooked up to all these TVs, and, and people could see themselves uh, there on TV. Anytime that uh, we had the camera running, the place was packed. Reynolds' financial issues were also getting solved. Asked the bank for some money, the bank said no. So I thought about it all night long, went to the bank, said, how many, t how many televisions do you have out there on, uh, on uh, you know, credit and they're buying? And the bank thought, oh, <laughs> says, you know, if we go out of business, you don't give me this money, all those television sets are going to sit there and you're going to have to pick up the, the money on it. Mr. Reynolds was a very smart man. The new station was being built on 5th Street, its tower next door. In Las Vegas, another station was also building, but for a time it looked like Reno would be first. Then a carpenter strike brought everything to a halt. So we were very disappointed when, when Las Vegas beat us on air. As fall approached, anticipation grew. One day before hoisting the antenna on the tower, Hughes and other engineers connected it to a piece of test equipment. And as soon as he turned it on, we see the Paul calls coming in, you know, hey, we're beginning to see a picture. <laughs> Finally, Sunday afternoon, September 27th, 1953, the new station, KZTV, signed on the air. You know, I think the street lights went dim because every, every house that had it, or any set that existed that was plugged in and had rabbit ears on it, was on, and here comes that flag, and KZTV was on the air. <laughs> It was a whole new world. The station and its community would be learning television together, and in the years that followed, they would find creative ways to bond and fill those broadcast days. It was, in many ways, a blank slate. Gentlemen, ladies, 
reception's great. Local shows, the radio station. KZTV is the station with the best affiliation. CBS for Reno and vicinity. Oh, oh that crazy TV. It went on like that. Thompson's the guy in the middle pounding on the bass. His trio was a frequent presence in those days in the local lounges and on Channel 8. Joe Marks. The station did have access to programming from all four networks, but shows like You Bet Your Life or Groucho Marx weren't delivered by satellite or even microwave over the Sierra. They arrived on films days or weeks after appearing elsewhere, and once here, they saw frequent use. We'd see reruns. I mean, we'd see Groucho Marx say the magic word, the duck will drop down. We'd see that thing. We knew when the duck was coming. Look, 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 the duck's coming. We'd seen the episode five times. We knew all the answers because we'd heard the questions. Everything else, programming and commercials, was generated locally in Channel 8's 5th Street studio by a small staff with one video camera. It's hard to explain what they produced, but today Zombo's House of Horrors may be the last echo of those days. It's your old pal Zombo welcoming you to... In the early days of Channel 8, there were a lot like him. I thought it was amazing that uh, you could take and put things together and show them on a screen and show them all over town. We put shows on just to fill air time. And limited only by their imagination, Yasmer and others did just that. They had all kinds of stuff. They had the kids come in with their animals. And... That would be Pet Pals, one of Yasmer's several creations. Kids and animals, a winning combination. Like the others, it was live and sometimes produced unexpected, memorable moments, including one Pet Pal episode when a carnival elephant with a full bladder relieved himself on air. Flooded the studio. It washed uh, a bunch of the merchandise out of the prop room into the alley through a back door. I got a condemnation from all my friends that I didn't even crack a smile. <laughs> I went through with the interview. <laughs> And this is live TV. You this is live TV, yes. Yeah. You had to stand there. Yeah. I was wet up to my knees. There were many others, local talent shows and interview shows with acts appearing in local showrooms, cooking shows, the Mighty Mites, local kids squaring off in a boxing ring. There were other kids' shows, a succession of them. Russ Sheldon, once a bell captain at the Mapes, then a sportscaster, became Uncle Happy. There was also the Kelo Kid, and if you look close, you might recognize CNN's Jack Cafferty beginning his career as Ranger Jack. Programming and commercials, all local and usually live. In the telling, it all sounds chaotic, but back then it was new and exciting, and the town quickly gave it a name. Call it crazy TV, you know, KZ TV. Well, KZ TV, crazy TV. It became crazy TV, and I don't think anybody ever called it KZ TV again. Three years later, it would have a new name and would expand its reach. Three years after signing on, Northern Nevada's first television station had established itself with a mixture of network and homegrown programming. With equal measures of amusement and affection, KZTV had been known to all as Crazy TV. But that would change as owner Donald Reynolds bought a local radio station and wanted the same call letters for Channel 8. KZTV became KOLO. But the young station faced a big limitation. A lot of people in northern Nevada still couldn't get its signal, among them Reynolds himself. In fact, that was one of the first questions that the consulting engineers asked me when we got on the air. I said, does he have a picture at his home on the lake? <laughs> Those concerns led to a bold decision, one that would challenge the engineering and construction methods of the time. The problem was the station's transmitter site at its Fifth Street studios. The solution, moving it to Slide Mountain, but it wouldn't be easy. Today, the summit of this 9,700-foot peak bristles with electronics. Back in 1955, it all had to be built. In those days, the FCC required an on-duty engineer at the transmitter site. That meant whatever was built there had to house equipment and staff at a site which sees heavy snow and wind that can sometimes reach 130 miles an hour or more. The solution was a unique one from an unexpected source. One of the consulting engineer's father worked for U.S. Steel, which built storage tanks for oil companies. Bob went to his father and asked him if they could redesign on a one-time only basis uh, this building to have the cupola up on top where the microwave had to be uh, and uh, put walls, interior walls and floors and that sort of thing. The result was a one-of-a-kind building. 
60 years later, it is still in use. The building contained everything needed to sustain the transmitter and staff, including living quarters. If building all of this on a mountaintop was difficult, so was manning it. Staff got there by ski lift or a slow climb in a four-wheel drive or snowcat. In winter, the building was often covered by snow. Shifts up here were long and lonely. Uh, one fellow and his wife would stay there three and a half days and then three and a half days off and the other couple would move in. Today, on-site staffing is no longer required, but at the time there may have been only a couple of other television stations operating from sites like this. There was no blueprint to follow. It was all pioneering work and important. Out there, beyond the visible horizon, past the last mountain range in view, were communities waiting for television. You know, you felt kind of good about that because uh, you really felt you were doing something of a community service to, to put that signal on. And as Northern Nevadans watched that new, stronger signal, many of the faces they saw on their TV sets became part of their lives. A few became cultural icons. None was as versatile, successful, or as long-lasting as an attractive blonde named Betty Stoddard. The Minnesota native had met and married veteran radio newsman Bob Stoddard, but like other local radio personalities, she soon gravitated to the new game in town. In time, she would be seen in a number of roles, but ask anyone who was watching at the time, and they will remember her hosting an afternoon movie. She gave it the name of her radio show, Be My Guest. The talent and the brand would be a staple of local television for the next 18 years. No story tells you more about Betty Stoddard than the day that found her preparing to do a commercial for a local market with a display of Thanksgiving turkeys while across the studio a supposedly tame mountain lion lounged on the set of an outdoorsman show. It took off the set, walked across right behind my camera. They should never have fresh meat in the vicinity of the lions and I looked back and here was the lion with a turkey in its mouth. Uh, you wanted more than a turkey. You do not try to take a turkey away from a lion. And she wound up, I think it's something like 14 stitches. Wounded as she was, she went ahead and did the commercial. Oh yeah, yeah. And then they call an ambulance. And now that's, that's being a trooper. That's, that's it. Betty was a great person. And a highly sought after spokeswoman. Whatever you were selling, if you hadn't been on Be My Guest, you you just weren't heard of. I'd buy like three minute spot on Betty Stoddard's show. Yeah. And if I didn't get 10 or 12 minutes on the air, air time, I feel, felt like I was getting cheated. <laughs> and I paid $75 for the three minutes. Hi, I'm Jim Henderson. I'm Jim Henderson opened uh, Keystone Owl Drug in 1958 and quickly became a presence on Stoddard's afternoon movie. In fact, he got so good that he sometimes filled in as host. But then a chance meeting with an up-and-coming comedy team got him the kind of exposure you can't buy. Dan Rowan and Dick Martin were driving to Elko, lost a water pump on their car, wandered into Henderson's drugstore. He loaned them $100, and it was the beginning of a lifelong friendship and eventually led to plugs like this on their hit network show, Laugh-In. I called you all week. Where you been? I was up in Reno uh, shopping, doing my uh, drugstore shopping. Uh-oh. You went up to see Henderson. Old Jim Henderson. Keystone Owl Drug. Yeah. Is they still got that great chapstick sale going? Oh, on? yes. You get 450 chapsticks for a dollar. Is that right? Did you bring me one? I brought you 450. By the way, they reimbursed Henderson for the $100 loan and for years could be seen on local TV giving a sales pitch for a Reno drugstore, all due to a broken water pump and a loan of 100 bucks. The station's programming had included newscasts from the beginning, but it was strictly rip and read, wire copy delivered by one of a succession of staff announcers. In 1960, one of them would be given a new assignment, and the news department, which would in decades ahead define Channel 8's place in the community, was born. It's someone you love. Bob Carroll was working at a Susanville radio station when he was offered a staff announcer's job at Channel 8. Like others, he did a lot of things besides the news, including hosting a local rock and roll dance show. There was a poor man, Dick Clark. The local high schools come in and they dance on Saturday afternoons. But Carroll was about to be given another role by then general manager Lee Hirschland. We're going to start a news department. I'd like you to be news director. I said, can't spell it, Lee. Don't know how to do it. He said, you'll, you'll get it. 
It started small, a four-person news department with a Polaroid camera, then film. It was black and white, of course, and at first silent. But then in the fall of 1960, a big event that demanded sound, a visit to Reno by former President Harry Truman. A sound camera was rented from San Francisco, and Carroll's interview was the first sound news footage shot in the Reno market. And billed as a non-political uh, affair today, is this correct? No, sir. That's a Democratic affair. I have one question. Carroll took to the news assignment with notable energy, getting out of the studio, aggressively covering stories in the field, learning as he went. Then in April of 1962, a welder's tank exploded in the basement of the Golden Hotel in downtown Reno. Carroll and his lone cameraman were having breakfast nearby. We saw all these fire engines headed for the Golden Hotel. And uh, yeah, that day we, we not only shot a lot of film, we had guys from L.A. calling. They were sending up private airplanes to get some footage on this thing. Carroll's news department established a number of firsts, including the first live broadcast of a State of the State address from Carson City. This was all done before tools like microwave and satellite trucks were even thought of. But 50 years ago, Carroll's news department was setting the standard for what would follow. In 1969, a young Texas native contemplating a job offer in Denver chose Reno instead. Like everybody else in this business, I had moved every couple of years, all through my 20s. And by the time I got to Reno, I was sick of moving and just fell in love with it and said, this is it. I'm not going anywhere. The Reno he found was a change from Texas, smaller than it is today, but as it has always been, what people in the business call a good news town. In those days, you wanted to talk to the governor, you called him up and talked to the governor, either on the phone or you went down there and did your sound bite, and everybody was much more accessible. And it kept Dunbar and his small staff busy. I regularly did maybe three stories a day like that. I know I once did six stories in one, one day. You'd go out on your way to something, you'd see something else and stop and shoot it. You know. But there was one time when the news department found itself at the center of a story and unable to report it. March 31, 1977, Colo TV had been operating for all of its 24 years from a two-story building on East 5th Street. Like other aging buildings, it was vulnerable to fire. It was a Friday, and the workday was following the same routine you'd see today. Crunch time for newspeople, sales and other office staff leaving. News director John Howe went to a nearby motel to meet a new reporter who had just arrived in town. Dunbar was beginning the 6.30 newscast, but something was wrong. We knew there was a fire in the building somewhere, you could see smoke looking across the studio. I said, let's watch our news. And it was kind of gray. I began to lose eye contact <laughs> with the camera, you know. I'm trying to sneak a peek over here and see what's going on. The fire was burning in a closet on the second floor. As Dunbar worked his way through a long lead story, it was starting to spread fast. We started losing systems in the control room, so the director made the decision to cut abandoned ship, and he cut the video first. The thing that everybody in northwestern Nevada heard was, cut, let's get the hell out of here. Legend has it, it was Dunbar. He says it was a young studio cameraman. One of my regrets about it is I never got a chance to say in other news, <laughs> we, are, we are on fire. We saved all the cameras and all that kind of stuff. And then we went out the front door, moved the vehicles from the front of the building, stood there and watched it burn down. But it was a total loss for everything except the yeah, things we carried out. Whatever equipment wasn't saved was quickly rented or bought, and the station found a new home in a building over on that corner at Vassar and Terminal. Three days later, Channel 8 was back on the air. In the year that followed, a new building was designed and built. Colo had a new home, but in the struggle to recover, had gained more than that. When we put our station back together, it was a deep sense of pride amongst all of us. Really, we all felt we were a part of that, that new, that new and revived KOLO TV. A new beginning and soon some new tools, ENG, electronic news gathering, video cameras replacing film, 
than microwave trucks. Live on the scene reporting became routine and was essential on breaking news. The area's first satellite truck allowed us to roam even further, covering major wildfires in our area. But it certainly is graphic. It's graphic. Uh, it's something that you look at. Right on. Let's go, Chair. Let's go, let's go. But also allowed us to follow local stories elsewhere. When Reno teenager Ryan Malloy received his heart transplant in Southern California in 1991, we were there to report the story. Ed, how's Ryan doing today? Well, uh, he's doing quite well. You know, this story has always been... In the years ahead, we'd travel much further when warranted, following local civilian and military personnel to Iraq in 2004. Nevadans involved in post-hurricane Katrina New Orleans relief the following year. has slowed in the last few days, but there's still work to be done. Nevada people are helping that happen. They've been courted for months by the various political campaigns. And to Iowa on the eve of our own first early presidential caucus in 2006. To the Mexican border and the White House last year. Other assignments put us in unusual settings closer to home. And what are the conditions like up there? Well, that bad above me, uh, it's a little... In the depths of Lake Tahoe during the first Tahoe summit, to inside a burning building in a special we called Get Out Alive. Well, we got everybody. All offices are now. I'm... Or staging a mock hostage crisis to show people how to survive another life-threatening situation in Run, Retreat, Resist. We've traveled far and put ourselves in unusual situations when necessary to bring you the that story. Now if you take a look. But through it all, our daily focus remains where it has been for 60 years. Had really severe On our community and our state, witnessing and writing its history one day, one page at a time. So together we've come a long way in those six decades, from the early days of crazy TV to the digital age of the 21st century. Our assignment, our commitment, remains the same as it was in 1953, serving Northern Nevada. As always, stay informed and be involved. Have a good evening. I would back up and, and relive it from the beginning in a second. It was so much fun. I'll tell you, it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. We had the opportunity really to step up to be kind of the cream of the crop. They were the pioneers that, that really started television in this market and continue 60 years later to this day of being an outstanding broadcast property.